basically. Let's go around the horn, and I'll assume if you give me a go, you've got no instrumentation problems. Booster? Go flight. Retro? Go flight. Fighter? Go flight. Control? Telcom? Go. TNC? Econ? Capcom? Go. Surgeon? Go. ONC? Go. AFC? NRAO? Go. Network? Go. You got everything up? Go. Hello, I'm Ian Christie, and this is Terranauts. Today on Terranauts, we have another installment of A Terranauts Guide to Leaving the Planet, which is our exploration of the history of spaceflight, the challenges that have been overcome in getting there, and the people who overcame them. Last time, we started talking about the first Terranauts and explored the life of Werner von Braun. Uh, you may want to go back and listen to that episode before you listen to this one. Today, we're going to continue the story but we're also going to introduce the next of our first Terranauts, Gene Krantz. But first we need to take a little detour to talk about the great space race and how it led both von Braun and Gene Krantz to have major roles, not only in taking humans off the planet, but to the surface of the moon as well. When we left our story, despite the fact that Werner von Braun saw his ultimate goal as leading humanity to the moon and beyond, he and his Pinamunda paper clippers had moved from working in Germany on ballistic missiles for the military to working in 1950s America on ballistic missiles for the military. And this was in part because in the U.S., the Eisenhower administration seemingly had no interest in going to space for the purposes of just going there. Uh, the U.S. at the time really only seemed interested in going to space so they could come back on top of a target in enemy territory. Well, there was no interest, that is, until the Soviet Union got there first, on the 4th of October, 1957. To understand why that mattered so much, it's important to understand the context of the time. Now, 1957 was only a bit more than a decade after the end of the Second World War. Europe was still being rebuilt, and it, like every other part of the world, was being divided into spheres of influence of the two major superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. At the end of the Second World War, the U.S. had occupied a pretty unique position in that it had come, it had come out of the, the war with its economy intact and also in possession of the atomic bomb, which gave it military capability that really couldn't be matched by any other country. Twelve years later, from the perspective of the United States, the world was beginning to look very different. First of all, alarmed by the conventional military capacity of the Soviet Union, the United States had adopted the so-called Truman Doctrine of containing Soviet geopolitical expansion. Well, the Soviet Union had responded by erasing the U.S. atomic advantage by demonstrating its own atomic bomb in 1949. While this leveled the playing field to some extent, the U.S. still believed that it enjoyed an advantage in atomic weapons in that it had the means to deliver atomic bombs directly onto Russian soil, mainly through strategic bombers and because of the proximity of U.S. bases in Europe to the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union lacked the same capacity to strike the United States directly. The development of ballistic missiles, though, was rapidly changing all that. As missile ranges increased, it became increasingly possible to foresee a day when atomic bombs could be launched from Russian territory and land in the United States. Now, in 1957, although this was seen as a possible future, no one thought the Soviets would get there first. In fact, it was probably pretty commonly assumed that the United States would master the technology of the intercontinental ballistic missile long before the Soviet Union, and that a lot of people assumed that the Soviet Union would only get the technology by stealing it from the West once it was developed. Which may or may not have been one of the reasons why the Eisenhower administration was not so keen on having a civilian program dedicated to solving the problem of getting to and staying in orbit. They really did prefer to keep all of the missile technology development a military program. But then came the 4th of October, 
1957. On that day, from its launch site in Kazakhstan, the Soviet Union successfully launched the very first man-made object into orbit around the Earth. The satellite, Sputnik 1, was a polished metal sphere, about 60 centimeters in diameter, with four radio antennas from which it broadcast a simple repeating beep tone that could be heard by any amateur radio enthusiast. For three weeks, it was a persistent audible reminder that the Soviet Union possessed a capacity that the United States did not. A capacity to reach any part of the globe from above. It changed everything. Suddenly, the United States no longer saw itself as the world leader in missile and rocket technology. Suddenly, Americans were stripped of their feeling that they were safe and sound on the North American continent, protected by two oceans between them and their potential atomic adversary. The uproar was immediate and deafening. The American populace and the U.S. Congress demanded that the United States respond immediately comprehensively, robustly. Now, in what truly may be interpreted as divine irony, when the news of the Sputnik launch broke, Werner von Braun was enjoying drinks before dinner at the Redstone Arsenal Officers Club with a room full of Department of Defense Army brass from Washington. In fact, the guest of honor was the newly nominated Secretary of Defense, Neil McElroy. The scene could not have been scripted any more perfectly if Hollywood had tried. When the news was announced to the assembled crowd, von Braun's first response was to blurt out that the U.S. could have done it two years earlier with his Redstone rocket. He told everyone who would listen, and many who didn't really want to, that they had the hardware on the shelf and only needed to be turned loose on the problem. He predicted that the United States could be in orbit in 60 days if only he was allowed to go ahead. Well, the administration resisted for a few weeks, but eventually in November, they authorized the Redstone Group to prepare for an orbital launch as a backup to the one planned by the Navy's Vanguard launch vehicle. When that launch failed spectacularly on the 6th of December, the press had a field day, labeling it variously Stayputnik or Kaputnik, and the way was open for von Braun and his Peenemunders to finally make it to orbit. And on the night of the 31st of January, 1958, after two launch scrubs for weather, they finally reached that goal, with the launch of a Jupiter-C rocket that had been put into storage, awaiting for just such an eventuality. Atop the rocket was the United States' first satellite, containing a small scientific experiment to study the radiation environment above the Earth's atmosphere. It was, at one moment, the crowning of Werner von Braun's career to that point, but it was also the point at which he would increasingly need to share the stage with other actors who would come to lead humanity's quest to travel to and live in space. See, until this moment, the challenge had always been about getting there. First, getting off the launch pad, and then getting high enough to reach space, and then finally to reach velocities sufficient to stay in space, in orbit around the Earth. But now, suddenly, a new question started to emerge. What are we going to do once we get there? Until this time, the point had always been to move something, usually a large amount of explosives, from one point on the Earth to another, which is why the getting there part really took center stage, since there was nothing about the payload that was very different from other large explosive devices. But now, if humans were going to put objects in space and have them stay there, it was suddenly important to talk about why and what they were going to do with them, and maybe most pressingly of all, how to interact and control them while they were there in space. In fact, one of the interesting anecdotes from the Jupiter launch was the fact that there was a period of time after launch when it was feared that the launch had failed because the satellite was simply not where it was supposed to be. The booster had delivered the satellite to orbit with a slightly higher velocity than expected, and thus it was not where it was in 
originally expected to be, and it took a while for the tracking stations to find it. It was a minor glitch in the grand scheme of things, but it pointed out what was actually an underlying weakness in the whole rocket and missile program. And that was um, summarized, as Tom Lear famously said in his song, once the rockets go up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Now, it's unfair to say that von Braun and company were truly unconcerned about this problem. But it is true to say that it was not their priority, and frankly not one that they had even really tried to come to grips with in all of the years that they had been launching rockets. They literally spent all of their time watching them go up, and no time at all working out the problem of how to figure out where they came down. In other words, they spent no time at all working on the problem of how to interact with the payload once it no longer had a rocket attached to it. In a sense, this is understandable. The problem of getting off the planet was big enough, but now that had been done. It was time for humanity to think about what it wanted to do in space, now that it possessed the means of getting there. And that job, for once, would not be the job of the military. A new organism was about to emerge, the Civil Space Agency. By 1958, uh, mid-July of 1958, Congress had passed the Space Act, which created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. It grew out of the Space Task Group uh, at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which had been known as NACA. It was headquartered in Langley, Virginia, and its immediate mandate was to put an American in orbit around the Earth as soon as possible. The first head of the space task group was Robert Gilruth, a name familiar to anyone who has worked at the Johnson Space Center, but maybe not to many others. One of the first things that Gilruth did was to begin recruiting engineers and scientists from across the United States and, and elsewhere who would effectively invent the science and discipline of spaceflight. Chief among the new disciplines that needed to be invented was that of flight operations, which effectively meant control of a spacecraft and monitoring of every aspect of its performance and the health of and well-being of its occupant. The first head of this organization was Chris Kraft, another name that would be familiar to anyone who has worked in mission control or in NASA's manned spaceflight program. In 1959, Chris Kraft hired a young engineer and ex-Air Force pilot named Gene Krantz, which is a name that everyone who has worked in MCC knows, and who is widely known outside of the building as well. Gene Krantz was born in 1933 in Toledo, Ohio. His early life and upbringing are about as different from Werner von Braun as you could imagine, but just about as emblematic of the kind of Terranaut that would staff the early U.S. space program as you could imagine. Krantz's father was the son of a German immigrant, and he died in 1940 when Kranz was only seven years old. Kranz and his two sisters were raised by his mother in Ohio. He graduated high school in 1951. He attended the St. Louis University Parks College of Engineering and Aviation Technology, obtaining a bachelor's degree in 1954. He was, in short, just about as middle American as it was possible to be. He grew up in a household where money was scarce and where hard work was expected. He also grow, grew up in an environment where it was expected that hard work would be rewarded, in an atmosphere where the limits were something that you placed on yourself, not something that the world placed on you. He was very much a product of the immediate post-war United States, where their future was expected to be bright and Americans were expected to lead the rest of the world towards that future. In high school, he wrote a thesis entitled The Design and Possibilities of the Interplanetary Rocket, in which he predicted that there would be a base on the moon in the next decade. The thesis was based in part on the work of one Werner von Braun. But Kraft's early love was not rocketry, but flight. He joined the U.S. Air Force Reserve and trained as a pilot. Upon graduation, he was chosen to be a fighter pilot, than is now a coveted posting for new pilots. Eventually, he was posted to South Korea, where he flew the F-86 Sabre 
over the Korean demilitarized zone. Upon returning to, from his posting to Korea, Kranz took a job with McDonnell Aircraft Corporation at Holloman Air Force Base, working on flight testing of unmanned rockets uh, and a vehicle dropped from a B-52 bomber. During this work, he learned the art and science of flight test and control, of trying to determine what was happening and later what had happened on board vehicles where the main evidence was provided by simple sensors and switches whose signals had to be decoded, recorded by chart recorders on long strips of paper, and then compared and combined to discover the truth of what had really happened thousands of feet up and hundreds of mile, at hundreds of miles an hour. It was this experience that ultimately prepared Kranz for his role in inventing spacecraft mission control. For his Terranaut journey, he didn't really require technical knowledge of rocketry or aerodynamics. He needed to be, and was, a master of taking disparate systems and dissimilar people and integrating the data and knowledge they possessed to understand a situation that he and they could not see, hear, or touch, but which they needed to understand and master in order to safely accomplish the next great milestone on humanity's journey off the planet. And that goal was of lifting a human being beyond the atmosphere and keeping him there for at least one orbit around the Earth. And yes, in the 1960s, it was going to be a him. In the fall of 1960, Gene Kranz, looking for a new challenge, applied to join NASA's Space Task Group. He was hired, as he admits himself in his autobiography, sight unseen by Chris Kraft. He arrived in Langley, Virginia in October 1960 to find a group that was in a positively febrile state of excitement and agitation. After its initial sprint out of the gate to get a satellite in orbit in less than 90 days, from deciding to really try, the U.S. Civil Space Program had had, well, mixed results. In 1959, in fact, of the 19 unmanned rocket launches that were attempted, Nine had ended in failure. But NASA was finally fully stood up. The Von Braun Group had moved from the Army to NASA and had been established at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Various portions uh, of the Naval Research Laboratory and other military organizations uh, had been assimilated as well. By the end of its first year of operation, it also had a mission, put an American in orbit as soon as possible. And the project now had a name, Project Mercury. By the middle of 1959, seven American test pilots had been selected to be the first astronauts and had begun training for their role. A contractor had been selected to build the capsule that would carry them to space, and that capsule had been designed and was in the final stages of being tested. The boosters that would carry the Mercury astronauts had also been selected. Splitting the difference between the Army and Air Force programs, NASA had decided to use two different boosters. For the first suborbital test flights, they would go with the tried-and-true Redstone booster, developed in Huntsville. But for the final orbital flights, they would use the Air Force-designed Atlas booster that featured a one-and-a-half-stage design that was powerful enough to get the Mercury capsule and its occupant above the atmosphere and also going fast enough to stay there. There was just one problem. Well, okay, there were a whole lot of problems that added up to one big problem. And that problem was that they hadn't launched anything like a Mercury capsule before. At all. And they were behind. The first Mercury Atlas booster flight had failed in spectacular fashion in August. To recover, the program had gone back to the Redstone booster to at least get some suborbital experience under their belt. And when Gene Kranz arrived at Langley, Virginia, NASA had yet to conduct a single Mercury test launch successfully, despite having stood the program up almost two years before. The astronauts had been selected, and the public was waiting to see them travel to space, and the Soviets were pushing ahead with their attempts of putting a human in orbit. But before NASA could even think about putting a human in a Mercury capsule, 
there was an awful lot of things they needed to figure out how to do and not to do. NASA was understaffed and under the gun. It was also populated by a staff of mostly young engineers and technicians who were motivated, inspired, and incredibly talented. In fact, when Gene Kranz arrived in late 1960, the Mercury Project was just in the process of assimilating a whole cadre of new Canadian and British engineers who'd arrived after the cancellation of the Avro Aero Project in Canada. Within two weeks of arriving at NASA, Gene Kranz was on a plane to Florida to Mercury Control at the Cape Canaveral Air Station, the launch site of NASA's manned spaceflight program and known to one and all hereafter as the Cape. Kranz had basically been told by Mercury Project Director Chris Kraft that since he didn't have anyone else, Gene would have to go to the Cape and figure out the countdown and the mission rules ahead of the mission team arriving for the first Mercury Redstone launch that was due to take place in less than three weeks. Well, that launch ended in abject failure. Kranz describes the scene vividly in his autobiography and refers to it as the four-inch flight, because the booster had ignited, but then the umbilical connecting it to the launch tower had disconnected prematurely, and it had shut down again and fallen straight back into the launch cradle. The premature shutdown of the booster had caused the Mercury capsule to decide that it was time to eject itself from the booster, and it had fired its escape rockets and blasted off, returning to Earth 1,200 feet from the launch pad amidst loudspeaker warnings for everyone in the area to take cover. It was not an auspicious beginning. To make matters worse, inside Mercury control... The engineer assigned as the booster flight controller, one of the Germans from the Marshall Space Flight Center, began excitedly troubleshooting the problem, in German, with his compatriots in the launch control bunker, and ignoring the requests and then the demands from the flight director, Chris Kraft, to be told what was going on. According to Kranz, Kraft eventually resorted to pulling the engineer's headset plug and demanding that he quote-unquote, speak to me, damn it. After the incident, Kraft reportedly said to Kranz, those Germans still haven't learned who they work for. Everyone in this control room must work for me. It was a seminal scene in the creation of what has become known as mission control and the mission control philosophy that Gene Kranz basically helped to create. As Gene Kranz would later say, at that moment he realized how unprepared the flight control team was to perform their duties. They had no technical data on the spacecraft or the launch system. Everyone was thinking in terms of the world of aircraft and not of rockets. They were dealing with a new control room, a new network, new procedures, and in fact, entirely new jobs. Upon returning to Langley following the embarrassment of the four-inch flight, as it became known, Gene Kranz vowed that there would never be another such embarrassment. He began assembling the technical data, information, and procedures that would be needed to create and train a professional flight control environment and a professional flight control team. Now, I had hoped to have time to talk about that process in this episode. In fact, that was originally what this episode was going to be about. Um, But there was so much context that we had to cover that we really have kind of run out of time to do that justice. So I think we're going to have to add another episode of the first Terranauts onto this one where we really talk about Gene Kranz and the early days in mission control. It really is a fascinating story, and I'm looking forward to telling it, but I just don't think we have time to do it today. So that's going to do it for this episode of Terranauts. As always, if you'd like to support the show, you can rate or review us on your favorite podcasting server app. You can respond with some feedback. We answer all the mail. Or you can recommend us to a friend. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon. Come on, let's keep the chatter down.